yeah, welcome to the AHA Behavioral Health Interest Group. And um, we have really exciting speakers on the topic of refugee mental health. So a lot going on in that space right now. Christine, Vanu, and Jerry have agreed to, to be here today to tell us not only about the services that their teams are providing, but really give us an overall sort of um, view of mental health services for refugees. So I will um, let them take it away. Okay, great. Uh, so I start off with a bit of a disclosure. Um, I just started in this job about two months ago. Uh, so I'm relatively new both to public health, to Colorado, um, and to working at Aurora Mental Health, but I'm not new to working with refugees. I've, I've spent the last six years working overseas with uh, refugees in countries of origin and in transition countries. Um, and now I'm really enjoying being here with Aurora Mental Health, working on the resettlement side of things. Um, and very happy to be joined by my colleague and co-pilot, uh, Banu, who is our supervisor for our health navigation services. And she'll be sharing more about those services specifically here in a bit. Okay, I don't need to, to go into too much detail for you all about uh, the city of Aurora and the community about why specifically we're providing our services here, but just a few reminders of the diversity of our, of our community that Aurora is the most, most diverse city in the state of Colorado um, and the third most diverse city of its size in the US. And so a country of, of this much diversity that says a lot about the diversity of Aurora specifically. Uh, according to 2020 data, more than 160 languages are spoken in local schools, which is very overwhelming to think of the jobs that teachers and support staff have to do to make sure that all children have access to an education. Um, and within the Aurora Public School, school Districts, 38% of people living there are foreign born. Uh, so an incredibly diverse community. Um, a majority of refugees specifically in Colorado are resettled there, about two thirds are resettled specifically to the Aurora area. Um, and this is why we have our Aurora Mental Health Center um, building in this, in this area. So we're at our um, refugee services are at our Galena Clinic, which is on the corner of Galena and Colfax. And that's, that's on purpose. It's close to areas where many refugees live. Um, and just interesting to note that this part of Aurora is also the highest level of poverty. Uh, so something to keep in mind as we're thinking about the services that need to be offered to these communities. I also wanted to start with some definitions because you might hear in the news refugees, migrants, immigrants, asylum seekers tossed around a lot. So it's always good to review some of the definitions of exactly who we're speaking about here. Uh, a refugee is someone who's been forced to flee their country because of persecution, war, or violence. So generally this is somebody whose life or, in, or life integrity is at severe risk such that they cannot stay in their home country. Uh, refugee is a legal term. Uh, and so there's refugee determination uh, system that determines whether people actually qualify as this term. Not an easy job in a, in a very difficult context, but we have this so that we can try to pro provide protection to those most in need. We also have asylees, and this is someone we see in our clinics as well. So an asylum seeker is a person who has left their country due to fear of persecution. Um, but they have not yet been recognized as a refugee. So they left their country first and are now seeking status to be supported in a country of safety. So they have applied for that protection in another country. Whereas refugees generally, when they arrive in the US, they've already been identified as a refugee and sort of have that status and qualify for official resettlement, which includes government support. And then finally, we have migrants. Um, a migrant is an immigrant or someone who changes his or her country of usual residence. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes migrants leave for the same reasons that refugees leave. It's, it's just sort of a term difference. Um, they haven't been sort of recognized as someone who officially cannot leave their country because of fear of persecution. That also includes people who leave for economic reasons, for climate reasons. So it's a more umbrella term for people who leave their country. Um, a lot of times in this work, we talk about forced migration. Uh, so just because somebody is a migrant and not necessarily a refugee or asylum seeker, it doesn't mean that they haven't left their country for very difficult reasons or that they haven't faced a lot of difficulties in their country of origin or along the path. Uh, so it's something we need to be very aware of when we're using these terms. Uh, in a larger context, 
Um, there's more than 1.4 million people in the world recognized as being an urgent need of resettlement. Um, and in 2020, less than 8% of those people were resettled, 107,800. So that leaves hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in limbo that can include in transition countries, in refugee camps, and in processing centers all over the world. Uh, historically, the US has been a very welcoming country for refugees. Uh, we've generally been the country that welcomes the most, though those numbers are shifting in recent years for a variety of reasons. Um, in the last few years with the previous administration, those numbers were lowered the most they've been lowered in, um, since the US officially started bringing in refugees. Um, that ceiling has since been lifted, but when you lower the, the number of refugees coming in, you also lower the amount of funding going to resettlement agencies and other social services that support these incoming refugees. So even though we raise the ceiling, we also have to make sure that the services are there to support the people who are coming in. So just a little diagram to show um, what that looks like over the last 10 years um, that the US has welcomed thousands and thousands of refugees, but that has declined in recent years. Um, and in 2021, we only resettled 11,411. Um, I imagine that number will increase precipitously in 2022, but again, we have to consider that it's not just about welcoming people, but it's also about having the infrastructure and the support to take care of them when they're here. Uh, and what kind of support do they need? Um, well, based on their past experiences, they need and deserve a lot of support. Um, people who are refugees, asylees, and some or many immigrants have experienced things like war, extreme amounts of violence, uh, lack of basic needs, including access to food, water, and shelter, physical injuries, infections, diseases, outbreaks, uh, famine, uh, torture in, in, in many countries of the world, forced labor, sexual assault, a lack to basic medical care, loss of loved ones for all of the reasons listed above, uh, separation from their families, from their communities, from their countries, from their connections, their cultures, uh, and everyone an uncertainty about the future. And then what do refugees specifically face experience upon resettlement? Um, even though refugees are arguably the people who get the most amount of resources and the government has programs to support them and, and we have nonprofits to support them, they're still facing this amount of issues. So finding affordable housing. Um, we're all local to the area, so we know how challenging that's been and how much things have shifted in a few years. And we all know, I think the government systems shift a little bit more slowly. Uh, so right now, uh, in the past, Aurora has been identified as a place where people could find affordable housing, but that has shifted quite quickly in the last few years. So this is an increasing challenge for the people that we serve. Finding employment, uh, language and communication barriers, racism and discrimination, and then community attitudes about people from other countries in general. The impact of disrupted education on children, but also on adults people who maybe had achieved a level of education in their home countries, but that's not recognized in the US, uh, can be very difficult for one's sense of identity. Distance and lack of communication with families in their home country and or countries of asylum. Uh, so for example, this could include Central Americans who then have left families in Mexico, uh, which isn't their home country, but that's country where they were seeking asylum temporarily. Uh, ongoing mental health issues due to trauma, including survivor guilt financial difficulties, visa insecurity, uh, for example, are um, people coming from Afghanistan right now are not automatically granted citizenship the moment they step off the plane. There still is a long path to citizenship that they have to follow and figure out and, and get resources to manage. Uh, and that's an extra burden they carry over their shoulders related to that uncertainty about the future. Uh, people also experience separation from their family members, living in blended families, new family and community situations. Uh, many cultures outside of the US are more collectivistic than ours. And so people are living, used to living together with extended family and neighbors in a very close way. Uh, and we tend to live a more individualistic lifestyle where we live in our home, a little bit separated from our neighbors. And this is, I think, a, a huge adjustment for people uh, when they come to the US. 
And finally, changes in roles and status of family members. So you might have older family members who previously were the breadwinners, but now because it's a little bit easier or, or the young people speak English or learn English more quickly, their role shifts to becoming the breadwinners and the shifts, uh, the social dynamics even within the family. So what do we offer now that we know all of the challenges and, and I'm sure there's many challenges that I have not listed. Um, what, are, what are we offering here at Aurora Mental Health? Um, so our refugee services are sort of divided right now between adult and youth services. Um, we have our Colorado Refugee Wellness Center, which is an outpatient mental health service for adult refugees, asylees, and immigrants. And now you know the difference among those terms. Uh, we provide a team-based, culturally and linguistically res responsive model of care. And we're focused on improving health equity by reducing barriers to accessing and effectively using health care. So we do that by having a multi, uh, multi-disciplinary team um, that includes both therapists from different backgrounds, psychology, social work, uh, professional counseling, and our very important health navigators, which you will hear about very shortly. On the other side, we have our Trauma Youth Resilience Program. This is a federally funded program by SAMHSA. Um, we're now in our sixth year of SAMHSA funding and our second grant cycle. Uh, so this program has proven its success already as we continue forward. It was designed to provide evidence-based trauma treatment and increase access to services specifically for refugee and immigrant youth, which goes up to young adulthood or age 24, um, and for those who've experienced trauma. Uh, and so experiencing trauma is, is ra rather inherent in the definition of a refugee. Um, so indeed, it's, it's not too hard for us to identify who, who we need to serve. We provide individual, family, and group therapy in our outpatient clinic on Galena, uh, in people's homes, though that's been difficult uh, because of the pandemic, of course, and also in schools, which was also severely hindered by the pandemic, but is something we're really eager to get back into in the upcoming school year. Uh, we also provide culturally sensitive and linguistically accessible treatment through our team of therapists and health navigators. And so I will pass uh, to my colleague, Banu, who will talk more specifically about our health navigation services. Thank you, Christine. Okay, patient navigation was introduced as a method of improving the engagement and effectiveness of cancer patient for underserved patient. Um, and then subsequent studies, including Anderson and Lark 2009, have shown the navigation improve access and engagement with social and mental health services as well. Having health navigators, clients can contact directly in their own language who understand their culture, increase access to care. Health navigators, um, or I mean, yeah, health navigators, they provide interpretation, resources, um, appointments, reminder in their own language, case management, care coordination uh, across different organization, arrange transportation for their medical and mental health appointments. And prior to COVID, we were able to do home visit when required and we were going out in the community whenever there is a need. Um, and I just wanted to share a case example here. So um, um, a client arrived from Burma six years ago and who spoke no English and was struggling to understand and navigate how, you know, many system in the US. He had been oppressed back in Burma and but was extremely worried about finding another type of job to support his family in this country, which needed to happen rapidly. And so he was very stressed and he started beginning like developing mental health problems. So um, what our Burmese health navigator helped him address him many of his need um, by enrolling in English classes, learning to use public transportation, providing information about the education system, medical and mental health services, and how does that work, medication refill, 
and different laws and right in this country versus Burma. Um, and then we did like we helped him find Asian grocery store in our area and also like connect him with other community members. Um, and then Navigator also helps uh, facilitate health and wellness group. And that depends on what the community needs. That's how we do it. So during the pandemic, we started social support circle, which provide information about COVID-19. And then in the past, we developed a Muslim women support group following the election of the previous presidents when some women wearing hijab were being harassed. And um, navigators also act as a cultural broker, enhancing linguistic and cultural understanding between providers and clients by um, ensuring that the meaning of the idea the provider is wanting to convey to the clients or it could be vice versa. It's interpreted appropriately when there may not be the exact word or concept in the other language. Um, and Navigator also helped clarify within or after the session culturally relevant information the provider or clients may need to know to fully understand one and another. Um, and there is a significant difference from interpreters and the navigators. Navigators are active members of mental health team who contribute feedback as needed during therapies session to enhance understanding. They are from the same community uh, as clients and most of them came as a refugee themselves. So they have firsthand experience. They are part of mental health team. So they have been, they have working relationship with therapists and have trained with the whole team to improve cultural responsiveness. Um, navigators are permanent staff with benefit at our mental health center, who, um, which provide investment in the organization, job security and team cohesion. And currently we have eight it health navigators who speaks 12 different languages. And we are in the process of hiring three more navigator, which um, includes like Dari, Pastu, Spanish, and Amharic. And then now I'll pass it back to Christine. Thanks, Vanu. Uh, and and uh, apologies here, I wasn't able to get uh, up-to-date photos for our entire health navigation team. So I have a few people missing that I apologize for, um, but this is most of our team represented. And we do indeed, as, as uh, Banu mentioned, have a, a female Dari Pashtu speaker starting next week and a couple more positions that we hope to fill. Uh, what's nice is that we've seen some of our health navigators uh, go on to get their bachelor's or master's degrees, and then they go out seeking jobs uh, with those new, new degrees. Um, so this job can be a nice stepping stone for people as well to advance their careers. So just a quick snapshot before we pass things over to Jerry about our services. Uh, since September 2018, we've served more than 2,000 clients. The average age is 30 years old of those clients. Um, that's because we have a strong representation in the teenage age group, thanks to our TRIP grant and the outreach services that we've been able to do to target youth in that grant. Um, but we see people across the age spectrum. 75% um, of our services are paid by Medicaid uh, and the rest of our funding comes from state, local funding, uh, Medicare and self-pay. Of course, our, our approach is that nobody should be turned away from care. So we offer sliding scale uh, for people without insurance. Um, we do see undocumented individuals and with our federal funding for youth, uh, that makes things easier because we're able to see people without any kind of fee. Uh, so that's a really important resource to have to reach undocumented people in Aurora. The primary languages that we see across both clinics are Spanish, Arabic, Burmese, and Karen, Nepali, and Tigrinya, uh, Tigrinya from the country of Eritrea in East Africa. 
Uh, and recently, as you can imagine, we've had a very strong increase in the need for Dari and Pashto for, for, for people coming from Afghanistan. Uh, so we have our new health navigator coming on board um, and we're paying attention, of course, to the changing refugee climate and how we might need to adapt our staff in order to meet the needs of the community. Um, in terms of what we see and what we treat, primarily we treat a lot of conditions related to trauma, PTSD, adjustment disorders, depression, and anxiety. And in youth, we see quite high numbers of uh, ADHD. The average number of services per client is 25 and a half services. So you see that we try to help people over a long period of time. As Banu mentioned in our case example, the, the people can present with a complex array of issues that need to be solved, including things as basic as making appointments or finding the right supermarket where they can find food uh, that is familiar to them going on to uh, trauma processing and uh, more in-depth psychotherapy. So we provide individual therapy, behavioral outreach, outreach sessions to try to engage people in care. Um, not everybody comes from a country where mental health is recognized or has a lot of vocabulary defining uh, the different kind of conditions in the same way that we do. And so we need to provide a lot of psychoeducation uh, to help people understand how our programming might be helpful for them. We provide case management services, largely through our health nav our wonderful health navigation team who solve all sorts of problems on a daily basis. And we also provide uh, behavioral health prevention and education, helping people maintain their overall wellness. Um, our data from our TRIP program shows a consistently positive impact on our clients, uh, improved functioning, mental health, housing, stability, education, and client satisfaction and social connection. Uh, in the first five years of our grant, those identified at, at risk um, improved in all of those categories. And we also saw a, a significant declines in PTSD symptoms, both in terms of the number of symptoms and also the severity of the symptoms experienced in our youth. We ran uh, focus group discussions to talk with families about their, pers their um, perspectives on uh, their children and the, and the outcomes of the grant. And they also supported our quantitative outcomes that they were quite pleased that they reported improved communication, coping skills and school performance in their youth. Uh, recommendations from the first five years of the grant that we're working on in the future in, in, include increased staffing, uh, increased training and trauma focused treatments uh, and increased groups. Uh, unsurprisingly, kids are, are more comfortable often coming to a group than sitting one-on-one -on -one with an adult and talking about, about their problems. Uh, and finally, uh, what do our services look like in the future? Um, interestingly, we want to try to merge our youth and adult programs, and that's sort of why I'm here. That's uh, the task that Banu and I have that lies before us, is to merge our youth and adult programs into one center of excellence. Since a lot of the services we provide on both sides are, are similar or the same, um, we want to maximize our capacity uh, to serve this population by, by having one center of excellence. We need to, of course, continue to adapt to the evolving needs of the refugee community in Aurora. Um, I don't, you know, a year ago, very few organizations had focus support for Afghans, for example, and now that's one of the predominant needs that we have. Uh, we want to reintroduce groups, uh, outreach activities, services in schools, homes and communities, all of the things that were waylaid by the pandemic. Uh, we shortly will have the addition of an employment specialist uh, helping to find folks with rapid employment into jobs. And we're looking into positions to support other major psychosocial needs like housing and legal support. And finally, we wanna improve uh, our assessment system to better monitor our outcomes and improve our effectiveness of care. And so that is all I have from our side. Um, I included our contact information here in the slides and anybody's welcome to contact us in the future or if you have any referrals or any other questions that we might be able to help you with. Christine, there is um, one question in chat. Sure. Marie, um, if, if we have a refugee family with children below the age of six, is there a way to refer the family for family therapy when it is the children who are identified as having the mental health need? Yes. So uh, somebody who's from another culture, refugee, immigrant, asylum seeker, they don't necessarily have to be seen in our clinic. If their primary need is related to their refugee status, generally we're the best clinic to support them. But at Aurora Mental Health, we also have an early childhood program. And so that program serves youth, a child, children under the age of six. 
So we would work based on the demands of the case with our early childhood program to find out which program might be best suited to support the specific referral. Um, it's not rare for our health navigators to support other clinics in our center. Uh, sometimes, for example, we have adults with serious and persistent mental illness, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and they might be better served by a clinic that focuses in the treatment of that disorder, but our health navigator can go with them to provide interpretation services and some case management um, based on the best needs of the client. And we do operate the um or have implemented the Child First program in our early childhood services area, which is a family-based, home-based program. So a family like this may be good candidates for that program as well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Cassie and Christine and Bonu. Uh, I have to say, Christine and Bonu did an amazing job to cover a lot of the bases. So <laughs> I don't really have to talk about it anymore. I think, you know, with her talking about the, definition of refugee and how to, what kind of process people have to go through to be able to come to this country, you know, the people of displacement and anything like that. So I think having those kind of basic concepts really help us to kind of moving into, like when I'm going to talk about what APDC can do and what kind of role does APDC play here in the community to be able to serve the refugees and immigrant community. So uh, kind of starting out at a little different place, I want to try and take your time. Um, that uh, Asian Pacific Development Center, it's a smaller community agency. And then we are partners of Overall Mental Health and we also accept this area agency of Overall Mental Health Center nowadays, just to be able to kind of serve the larger communities, have more resources, you know, um, provided for the people who are, who are needing it. So um, a quick kind of, uh, introduction about APDC as an agency. So you can see that on the picture, that's our building here. And a lot of things that it's very similar to what Kristen says that you know, so APDC office were located right off of Alton, which is like two blocks away from Yosemite and Colfax. And if you're familiar with this kind of area, you'll know that this is like Kristen said, that this is exactly where our newly arrival refugees oftentimes being resettled, you know, for a long history of years because this is the most affordable area for people to be resettled and have their own apartment, you know, here in the Denver, on the verge of Denver and Aurora. So um, we're located here. It's because that we want to be able to provide easy access for people that who can really just kind of walk to APD, no matter it's for classes, for different services, for therapy sessions, or for just coming over and trying to talk to somebody to be able to get some help. So that's the reason that why we're here in the heart of the neighborhood. And we're really proud of that um, because like our staff also get to walk on the street sometimes, you know, go to visit other people in the community and who lives in the neighborhood that we know that are needing some help from us. You know, sometimes our navigators will let us know that, hey, there's a new family that just arrived and just moved into the neighborhood in the last couple of weeks. And we'll try to get connected with them and have send somebody, a staff member maybe, and a navigator who speaks their language to go over and to visit them and to make sure that they know that there are services available here at APDC. And if they have any questions they need to reach out, they can always reach out to the navigators that speak in the same language. The vision of APDC is really to provide culturally relevant services and then empowering and enriching immigrant and refugee lives. Um, you know, and our mission is to really advance the well-being of Asian Pacific Islanders communities by providing culturally appropriate and integrated medical, behavioral health, and related services, you know, for the community members. A quick, you know, history about APDC. We were funded in the 80s, and we just hit our 40-year anniversary, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, that, when in the 80s, that was the time that, you know, there was an influx of, you know, uh, refugee from Vietnam and some other Southeast Asian countries at the time. That was kind of the first and the second way of the uh, refugees coming into the state of Colorado. And the group of mental health professionals really kind of just got together and thought about, you know, we really don't have an agency or just like a place that's designated to serve our Asian, our API, Asian American Pacific Islander communities. And that's why APDC started. Uh, that's how we started with we really just want to kind of focus on serving the AAPI communities, no matter they're immigrants, asylees, or refugees. So, 
you know, we've been in the community for more than 40 years. We have figured out like the best way to serve the community. You know, a little bit, I think with what Christine was talking about with the Colorado Refugee Wellness Center, we uh, complement each other very well because the Refugee Wellness Center and the Trauma Resilient Youth Program really focusing on serving the mental health needs of the community. And at APDC, other than the mental health needs of the community, we do just a little bit more because we kind of figure out like throughout the years that the best way, like I said, to serve the community really is kind of have more wraparound services. And we're very fortunate to be able to have um, the luxury to be able to use that model to serve our communities of refugees and immigrants here. Um, So some of the things that we kind of see throughout the years, you know, what are the needs really from the community? And these are the things that we kind of put together and learn throughout our way, right? Serving different communities of refugees here um, can be resettled in the Colorado. So some common things that we see is the welfare system, resources connection. When you first arrive in this country, I can speak from my own experience as an immigrant here, is that you really kind of are at loss a lot of times. Like you really don't know how do you go to the hospital to see a doctor. You don't know what the health insurance means to you. You don't know what welfare means to you. You know, in a lot of the countries in this world, there's no such a thing as welfare, right? Food stamps, you know, uh, cash system and things like that, TNF even. So these are all brand new to the people who are new to this country. So to be able to provide education and let them know that, hey, if you're in need, these are some of the things that be able to support your family to get through this very difficult time. And the goal of these support is to be able to help your family to get on your feet and then to be able to support yourself in the nearly future. And I can tell you from my own experience working with different clients from the community, I've seen that happen many times. I've had families that, you know, was getting welfare and living in Section 8 housing, and really eventually they were able to save money and kids get to go to school. Um, They really got to a place that they were able to buy their own house and live in the community, even go out to eat and some things. You know, for the newcomer in this country, even thinking about going through a drive through sometimes, it's very nerve-wracking. Thinking about language barrier and culture barrier that you're going to have to go through, right? People speak English very fast. Can you hear it clearly? Do you know what you're going to order through the headphones and speakers and all those kind of things? Very small things that we take for granted every day in our lives is actually not easy, not coming easy for our um, refugee immigrant communities at all. So welfare system resources connection, those are things that are very important for the people that we serve learning and navigating through the U.S. system. Like I said, a lot of times they have to go to the county. What does it mean? Which department do they go to? When they go there, you know, do they have to make an appointment? Do they pick a number, you know, when they arrive at the office? How long do they often have to wait? We have to kind of provide education and sometimes warn them about that, right? When you go to the Department of Human Services, a lot of times you have to wait at least one to two hours to be able to get to talk to somebody. And what kind of paper do you need to bring? All those things. So a lot of small things that provide education uh, and knowledge for them to be able to navigate through the system here uh, in the United States. Address language and culture barriers. I think that is very obvious, you know, and that relates to all kinds of different things, right? So at APDC, um, you know, I was, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the specific services that we offer here. And address language and culture barriers are really kind of the top priority for us doesn't matter what kind of services that you're receiving here at APD. So I'm so appreciative that Christy and Bonnie talked about uh, the position and the job and you know, the responsibility of a navigator and how is it different than a regular interpreter is because we're very proud of the navigator uh, staffs here that at APDC in our agency because without them, we literally cannot do any of our job. They are here to connect us and the community because they know the language and the culture. So they're the culture broker for us. You know, a lot of times that they have, we have people just kind of walk into the office building from the community. And not all the time, but our goal is oftentimes we have somebody that who able to speak a little bit of their language, um, if that's a barrier for them, and to actually let them know that what are things that they can get help for here in our office. So that's something we always keep in mind. Again, no matter what kind of services that people are getting from APDC. Employment, that's a big thing, right? Living in this country and in this world, if you're in the capitalist world, 
that employment is very important, not just for financial reasons, also gives people a sense of fulfillment as well. So how do they actually build life for themselves and their families here in the United States? And employment is a big thing for them. School enrollment for the kids, school system is obviously very different compared to some other countries. And for some other countries that before kids hit a certain age, family helps to be able to take care of the younger children, right? Um, but in the United States, especially a family that is resettled here, that we got a whole lot of um, more like a extended family support that what about child care, right? And then I, as an immigrant, I learned that in the hard way that in this country, if you go to public preschool, the school is only oftentimes four days a week and two and a half hours a day. So that's a challenge for our community members that who actually parents want to be able to work part-time or full-time, right? With the lack of support of child care, uh, how are they going to be able to actually get a job, work in a job, and have enough financial resources for themselves? So a lot of these things that, again, that we take for granted every day that we don't really think about can be huge barriers, you know, for the community that who are new, communities who are new to this country. Basic coping skills, do they know where to shop, do their cultural food, do they know that if there's any community organizations that for the people from the same culture, speaking the same language, um, do they know that if there's any particular areas that you can go for maybe restaurants or other resources that provide it for specific cultures and languages? Um, and then do they know how to be able to reach out to other people in their community, creating that social circle, which is very important for a lot of people. Transportation, driving is a big thing, right? In this country, having your own vehicle, be able to take yourself to places, it's definitely being promoted and it's very important which is, might not be the case for a lot of new people that come into this country. So the public transportation or driver's license, only in a car or not, um, or any other resources that's available for them, this is also something that can be very challenging for our newcomers. Guaranteeing support. This goes into a little bit even more about, you know, kind of generational gaps, acculturations for immigrants and refugee families. You know, a lot of times young children come into this country being educated under a different culture and different system, right? So they see themselves as Americans when the parents, first generation immigrants, don't see themselves sometimes as Americans or the acculturation levels are very different between the generations. And that a lot of times create different challenges and even conflicts, uh, disagreements between generations because the expectations are very, very different the way that kids are expecting the parents to be able to provide support for them, showing affection to them, is very different compared to the parents and what they're used to, how they were taught, you know, from their cultural origin. How can they show love and affection to their kids? And the gap in between, a lot of times, that's what we're facing, you know, when we work with families coming into our office. Mental support and resources. Obviously, not everybody who comes into this country as immigrants and refugees have particular mental health needs. But doing outreach and education is something very important for our communities and our population, at least letting them to know um, that if you are experiencing things like this, first of all, it's okay if that's normal. Secondly, that there are different things that we can do to be able to help to support them. And there are different things that they can do on their own to be able to help support themselves or their family members. So not necessarily getting everybody enrolled in mental health treatment, but letting people know that you know mental health it can be a new concept for them, but it is a concept. And we do have resources for people uh, when they need assistance and help and support for those. Speaking on time. Okay. So uh, kind of going to a little bit more in details about what we provide here at APDC. So obviously the first one we're going to talk about is our behavioral health clinic. We provide all kinds of different mental health treatment services. We do individual therapy family therapy, couples therapy, whatever is needed you know, for our communities. And we also have psychiatrists working for us, with us. So we provide psychiatry evaluation, medication management. Groups are extremely important for our communities. And we have groups for elders in the community um, to help them to be able to connect to, with each other. We have wellness groups doing more like prevention work, education skills training with our established clients to teach them different coping skills. So sometimes it's kind of different skills that to be able to help them to be more independent living in this country that which is different from their country of origin. 
Uh, we're very proud of our gardening and horticulture therapy group here at APDC. If you've ever been to APDC, that you'll see we have a huge community garden in the back of the building that we work together with Doc, Denver Urban Garden, to be able to establish. Because for our community, that to be able to grow things in gardening and agriculture is something extremely important for them because that's where they came from a lot of times, you know, and being resettled in a city, they see all the land that's available. They're like, oh my goodness, that what can we do with those? Every land that is not being used for them, it's so to speak like a form of waste. So be able to provide that community garden and also horticultural therapy group for our established clients is something that's very important, you know, for them. Case management, we help with transportation. Um, a lot of times that setting up appointments with medical doctors or specialized doctors um, or reach out to resources, welfare applications, community outreach. We do a lot of prevention work and education workshop in the community, uh, mental health education and prevention, culture training and cultural consultation. Sometimes we have other agencies reach out to us, asking us to provide knowledge and some training for them to be able to be more inclusive or knowing the better way to have some knowledge and skills to be able to work with uh, maybe their staff or maybe the people, their customers or their clients better when it comes to cultural inclusivity. Uh, culturally language appropriate treatment for families involved with social services. A lot of times we have to be the advocates for our families, you know, with social service to let the social service know that, you know, if certain cultures are practicing parenting skills in certain ways, Sometimes it doesn't mean necessarily that it's wrong. It just means that they also need to learn that what is appropriate and not appropriate when it comes to facing the legal system here in the United States. And what are some better ways that they can use to be able to provide better support for their children, especially when their children are growing up and being educated in this country. We have some other amazing departments at APDC as well, since we are a community agency. We have adult education that is funded by our state. It's one of the biggest adult education programs here in the state of Colorado. They have all kinds of different classes. They have English classes. They have citizenship classes, help people to prepare for their citizenship interview. We have teachers and staff here um, being trained particularly to help with people with their citizenship applications. And we have that workshop. Actually, we have one coming up this weekend. So on a quarterly basis that we have actually immigration attorneys that are being trained coming in to help with people with those applications, which is really amazing. Adult-based education, helping people to get their GED and to be able to move on to higher degree, job, job readiness, career choice, computer skills, and we even have, have text preparation workshops. Um, they work with this, uh, a particular firm and then they provide free text preparation workshops during the tech season to serve our communities because oftentimes our communities don't have their financial resources to go on and find an accountant to do their taxes for them. And this is all new, right? Our Youth Leadership Academy does different after-school programs in different schools here in uh, Aurora Public School District. They have some tutoring services. They definitely are encouraging to have, and have mentoring services for a lot of the youth in the community. They have leadership development with some of the youth that, you know, kind of went through the program throughout time and would probably be very proudly saying that, that some of the youth actually went through the leadership development um, program and became staff here at our youth academy when they are starting going to college at an older age to serve the younger generations that are coming in from the community. Our other language connection is our interpreter's bank. Uh, it provides interpretation, translation services virtually, in person. There's more, over 50 languages available. Um, and they also provide amazing Bridging the Gap training, which is the interpreter's certificate training uh, for people who are interested in becoming certified interpreters to serve their communities. And we also have a victim assistance program. And this is funded by the law enforcement here at in the state of Colorado. Um, uh, then they serve. Uh, really kind of any communities, obviously focusing on AAPI population, that if anybody become a victim of crime in any store, that we have a hotline, they can call us for crisis counseling. Um, a lot of times they will help them to, that advocate will work with them and through the legal system, go to the core, um, trying to find, you know, low-income legal assistance a lot of times, file victim compensations you know, personal advocacy and sometimes life consultations and 
and we also help them to refer them to other agencies that can provide other services for them. What is so unique about APDC? We are a specialty clinic here in the state of Colorado, particularly serving the AAPI community, which is very unique. And I have to say, when I first came to Colorado 12 years ago, with the diversity level here in the state, I didn't know we were going to have an agency that serves the AAPI community. So we're very proud of that, actually. Even our community is not maybe the biggest one here in the state of Colorado as a minority, but we have a place for people to go. Um, we don't provide just psychotherapy or behavioral services. We try to have wraparound services, including all the other things that's needed you know, by the community. Um, as a therapeutic process, we oftentimes address all barriers clients encounter when moving to or living in the U.S., and we assist them to adjust to the mainstream system. So it's not just about maybe you know depressive symptoms or anxiety struggles. We help, we try to make sure that they get resources to get to a place that they feel like they can be independent and use their autonomy to build life for themselves here in the U.S. Here are just some uh, examples of different languages that we use um, to serve the communities. Um, Laotian, Chinese, which is all Mandarin, Cantonese, Taiwanese, Thai, Japanese, Korean, Cambodian, Vietnamese, and Hmong. Uh, these are some of the older communities that have been here a little bit longer, and we have the newer communities, right? The Burmese-speaking community, Korean, Korean, Chen, uh, Rohingya, um, Bhutanese, Nepali-speaking, Indian, Filipino. Uh, we also have, uh, in the last couple of years, we really kind of started ramping up serving our um, Pacific Islander, Micronesian communities as well. Um, and also, like Christine was saying, that the newer communities, the newcomers of the Afghan communities coming who are Dari and Pashto speaking a lot of times. So these are all the languages that we use and more than that oftentimes to serve our communities. Just something to keep in mind, you know, even though we focus on the AAPI communities, um, there are definitely are some differences um, within the AAPI communities, right? Depends on their experience here coming to the United States. Um, different levels of education, literacy, religious belief, their self-identified issue of ethnicity group, like people telling you that they're from Burma, but you oftentimes need to ask which ethnicity group that do they identify themselves with, because that can make a whole lot of difference, you know, for themselves and for you working with them. Respect of hierarchy, this is more like a traditional collectionist culture belief that's been practiced in Asia, um, and learn helplessness. Are they immigrants or refugees? You know, how long have they been in the refugee camp before they're resettled into a new country? Oftentimes, that creates differences for them to be able to feel that um, advocacy for themselves, be able to be proactive and you know work their way through here in the United States. There's some pictures I would like to show people: some traditional outfits and events, you know, with all the different communities that we work with. And some more pictures of showing what people, people what we do here at PDC. You see all the different colorful vegetables here and produce. Actually, that was our horticultural therapy group. That's their garden. So all the different things that they grow, and you see uh, they're very proud of that. In the summertime, if you stop at APDC, you probably can get like a free zucchini to take home with you. So because we just have them all sit around different places. So you can see some other pictures of different, you know, holiday events. Other wellness groups, youth groups, and when they go out for camps in the summertime. This is an example of our newest uh, community that we're working with for the Afghan community. We've created flyers to kind of show them all the different services, particularly the new educational group that we're going to start with them. And this flyer is being translated in both Pashto and Dari, so people have access to them and can understand what we're providing. Okay, so. I'm going to kind of just, you know, I'm um, going back to Kathy and also open up to you if any questions that people have about ABDs and what we do. Thank you so much, Jerry and uh, Christine and Bonnie. I think that's super helpful information. We really, really appreciate. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Such an important such important work and population that we need to be um, you know, supporting. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the work that you all are doing. Thank you all. Have a Thanks wonderful everybody. Have a great day. day.